Welcome to our next discipleship class. So today we're going to walk through uh, Paul's greatest defense. I think that it will bear out to certainly be that. It was a masterful work. Um, don't want to give you a whole bunch of spoiler alerts. Uh, we'll get into it. But uh, the, the real question is, um, will we be able to actually give a defense for our own faith? And I think that that's one of the things that we try to do on this channel is give us an understanding of the evidences for Christianity. Um, and uh, this gives us an opportunity, actually, to walk through something that Paul did and what God used him to do and then kind of model it, look at it and analyze it a bit. Now, obviously, we have to go through a number of chapters. So um, let's see how this goes. So uh, for an outline, what we're going to do is we'll look at the text that we're going to focus on. Uh, then we'll look at the context, which is important. We'll see God's purpose in it. Uh, we'll also see God's protection in Paul's life as he goes through this. Now, Paul exercises his own wisdom. I believe certainly that God gave it to him, but Paul needed to exercise wisdom for the position that he was in. Uh, and then he had to use the opportunity that God placed in front of him, as we should be. Uh, then he gives his defense, his apologetic, and we'll look at some lessons that we can learn from that. So let's start with the text. And here in chapter 26, verses 6 to 8. Now again, Paul has a lot that he's saying in this chapter. We're only going to be able to focus on some particulars, but it will give us a good understanding of where he's coming from. He says, and now I stand, and he's talking before uh, Felix Agrippa and an entourage of people, and now I stand and am judged for the hope of the promise made by God to our fathers. It's talking about Israel. To this promise are 12 tribes earnestly serving God night and day hope to obtain. For this hope's sake, King Agrippa, I am accused by the Jews. Why should it be thought incredible by you that God raises the dead? Now, the you here is in the plural, so he's not just, though he's speaking to Agrippa, he's addressing the entire audience, and they would understand that standing there. And then further on in the chapter, uh, because he introduces this aspect of the resurrection, he says, therefore, having obtained help from God, to this day I stand, witnessing both to small and great, saying no other things than those which the prophets and Moses said would come, that Christ would suffer, that he would be the first to rise from the dead and would proclaim light to the Jewish people and to the Gentiles. For the king, before whom I also speak freely, knows these things, for I'm convinced that none of these things escapes his attention since this thing was not done in a corner. Uh, this was not a secret thing that happened. This was very public and known to everybody around Jerusalem and Judea. So, uh, again, the issue of the resurrection is the central focus here. And so I want to move on and look at the context. So, Acts 21 is needed for the context of Acts 26. So, reading chapter 26, independent of the previous chapters, doesn't account for why Paul is before Agrippa. Now, certainly people can read Acts 26 and say, wow, that's that's a great defense and everything. But it doesn't have its full impact unless you understand where it comes from. How did Paul get there in the first place? What was he doing there? Um, and we have to go back to Acts 21 to really gain that understanding. Now, <clears throat> in Acts 21... Paul's arrival in Jerusalem was greeted by the elders as he brought gifts from the Gentile churches, and he was excited to share with the leaders what God was doing among the Gentiles. Should be plural there. So um, the issue here is that um, Paul was going to Jerusalem um, related to the church, what God was doing, uh, with the Gentiles and the development of the Gentile churches. Now, <clears throat> it's important to note that um, in chapter 21, 
we're going to see really kind of a failure of the leaders in Jerusalem. Now, as a background, um, we learn that the Jerusalem church was headed up by James, the Lord's half-brother. Uh, he was the pastor, and it was a very Jewish church. Obviously, they were all Jews. They were first century believers. This was not long after the resurrection, obviously, that it was established. And at this point in time, there were many believers in Jerusalem. Um, and some of the Jews were freer than others in regards to being open to the, uh, the gospel going to the Gentiles, and, and others were not. Um, now, at the same time, many that still adhered to the law felt that Gentiles needed to come under the law in order to be saved. In other words, they needed to be circumcised and keep the law of Moses no differently than the Jews. Uh, unfortunately, that's still preached today among a lot of people. Uh, it's a heresy. The book of Galatians really goes through that and uh, decimates that whole concept. But the, the problem that Paul had as he approached this situation in Jerusalem was that many people felt as though many in Jerusalem felt as though Paul was um, preaching against Moses and against the law and against circumcision for their children because Paul was emphasizing faith in Christ alone. Uh, again, he addresses this in um, his letter to the Galatian churches and the important thing there is to realize that there were Jews that were focusing on what Paul was teaching, misunderstanding his teaching. In other words, he wasn't teaching as much against the law as the fact that the law had no more um, authority over a believer because Christ has redeemed us from the law. So, uh, Paul's message was not well understood by a lot of the Jews at Jerusalem that were very legalistic. Um, and so, as it says in this paragraph up here, halfway through, however, the leaders had other things on their minds that because uh, the topic of con uh, conversation uh, between them and Paul. So, um, so what became the topic of conversation was Paul... Um, there's a lot of Jews that are going to hear you're here in Jerusalem. Uh, they believe that you're teaching against Moses and the law and everything else and against the temple. So um, they, they were basically asking Paul to accommodate them and what we'll get into in a second. Um, I think it was a mistake. I mean, I think Paul, from his perspective, was in a very difficult position and he was willing to accommodate what they thought. In a sense, he was on their turf and I fully understand why he did it. However, I think it was a failure of those in the Jerusalem church to ask him to do that. So James and, um, and other Jerusalem church leaders asked Paul to join others in a Nazarite vow, since he had a reputation among legalistic Jews that he was preaching contrary to Moses and the law. The leaders felt this action would show he was not against the law and satisfy the many zealous Jews in Jerusalem during the Feast of Pentecost. Now, the reason that I think this is a failure on the leader's standpoint, and what's interesting is the Jerusalem church really um, loses focus in the book of Acts, and the church, of, um, the church founded at Antioch becomes really the focus. It moves from Jerusalem to Antioch, the center of where God is working out of, um, because they actually limited themselves. They limited themselves in what they were able to do. Uh, they did great among the Jews, but the problem is, is that they were not open to get any further than that. Uh, though they understood that Paul was bringing the gospel further, um, they were still prepared to compromise certain aspects. Instead of trying to address the issue where it needed to be with the Jews that were legalistic, what they're doing is they're asking Paul not to upset the apple cart um, and to, you know, take on this Nazarite vow. But it was really deceptive in what they were asking him to do. There was a lack of honesty here because in reality, um, he was only doing it 
to give the appearance that he was still connected to the law, which really he wasn't in that way. So <clears throat> Paul agreed to their plan. However, the plan was flawed. Now, I think G. Campbell Morgan gives a great overview. He says the advice of these men, which was that of policy uh, and of dishonesty with all to the consent of Paul, uh, I hold that Paul made the greatest mistake of his ministry on this occasion. Yet we have to recognize the fact that the reason of his consent was not that of expediency merely, not that of policy, but that of devotion. The reason of his consent was his desire to win his brethren. This was not the action of a man, uh, politic, expedient, and attempting to manipulate circumstances to prevent a breach of the peace or a riot in Jerusalem. It was not the action of a man trying to save his own life. It was the action of a man who passionately and earnestly desired to do anything if by the doing of it he might deliver the message to his brethren and win them, which we know was Paul's supreme desire. Look at the action in itself. It was the doing of that which was of no value to him. It was consent to an appearance contrary to conviction. And I think G. Campbell Morgan really hits the nail on the head here. By the way, his um, commentary on the book of Acts is extraordinary. Um, I don't know if it's still in print. It could be online somewhere, but um, if you can get it, it's well worth the money. Now, while Paul was in the temple completing the vow, some of the Judaizers, these zealous Jews for the law, saw him and attacked him. Uh, now, these Jews had obviously uh, traveled um, to follow Paul uh, through Asia Minor. We see this earlier in the book of Acts um, as he went through uh, Thessalonica and then Berea and on to Athens. So uh, they were always tracking him, trying to get him, and it's like he had to keep escaping them. Uh, it's like a spy movie. So while he was in the temple completing the vow, some of the Judaizers saw him and attacked him. He was rescued by the Romans and given an opportunity to speak with the Jerusalem Jews, that's Acts 22, to try to resolve the riotous confusion. The goal of the Roman leaders was to keep peace in Jerusalem. Um, look, every holiday that the, um, that the population in Jerusalem rose up, there was more of a potential for um, unrest and everything else. There were zealous Jews that were like uh, trying to take out Romans with some guerrilla warfare. There were, um, there was just more people. There was more opportunity for um, disputes and problems. So the Romans had a difficult time during these times keeping peace. And the local governors and all that were tasked with that from Rome. So um, they did whatever they needed to do to make sure they kept it peaceful. So Paul spoke in Hebrew to the Jews on the steps of the Antonia Fortress, which was a palace and barracks to the soldiers, Roman soldiers, on the northwest corner of the temple area. It had an observation tower to the temple area and stairs with instant access to the temple courtyard. So this is kind of a police station up on the temple mount, gave the Romans a place to house a number of soldiers um, and uh, immediately get to any problem that could be there in the Temple Mount. So Paul was on his way up these steps in the Antonia Fortress and asked if he could talk to the Jews. So uh, the uh, Roman um, chief captain, uh, Lysias, allowed him to do that and then so it says here, Paul gave his testimony. The Jews listened until he mentioned that God had sent him to preach the gospel to the Gentiles. At this point, the Jews became unruly, wanted to kill Paul. The Roman soldiers had to secure Paul to prevent him from being beaten to death by the enraged Jewish crowd. Now, this is really interesting. If you read through Acts 22, you realize that Paul is just, he's just telling them what happened. He's telling them what happened on the road to Damascus, basically how he got saved and commissioned by Christ. And he says that God sent him to preach this, this gospel to the Gentiles. Luke makes the comment 
he's the author of Acts, he says, and when he said this word, talking about Gentiles, he said, they just snapped. That's when they went crazy and wanted to kill him. They said he wasn't fit to live. Um, you know, they very legitimately had Gentile derangement syndrome. I don't know how else to classify it. You could not mention the Gentiles in any favorable light to these Jews without them becoming enraged. So Lysias, the chief captain, did not know what Paul said to the crowd in Hebrew. So he didn't speak Hebrew, but assumed he was causing un the unrest that resulted, right? Thus he had him taken to be examined by whipping. Lysias thought Paul was uh, an Egyptian uh, that had caused previous riotous uprisings. However, Paul identified himself as a Jew. It was at this point Paul asked if it was lawful to scourge a Roman citizen uh, that was not condemned by Roman law, which it wasn't. Uh, Paul, since Paul was born a Roman citizen in Tarsus, um, uh, a free governed city by Rome. So Paul was, though he was not Italian, uh, he was born in a city that was a free city uh, that Rome governed, and so he had a Roman citizenship. Lysias released Paul from his chains and told the Sanhedrin, which were the ones that were all upset now at this point, to come so the matter could be addressed the following day. So the charges needed to be clarified as to Paul's guilt or innocent. Innocent. So it says here in 2230, the next day, because he wanted to know for certain why he was accused by the Jews, he released him from his bonds and commanded the chief priests and all their counsel to appear, which was the Sanhedrin, and brought Paul down and set him before them. So um, Lysias is just, he's taking the normal courses of action. He's like, okay, I got to figure out what's going on here. You know, I have somebody really violating the law, doing something wrong. So he wanted to know what this guy was being accused of because he certainly didn't see him do anything wrong as a Roman citizen. So Paul stood before the Sanhedrin, now we're into Acts 23, in the presence of the chief captain and his soldiers who oversaw the exchange. Paul realized that the Pharisees and Sadducees who were present disagreed on their view to the resurrection, which was the foundational issue Paul was in Jerusalem to discuss in the first place regarding Christ. Since it was the central issue with Paul, he used it as the leverage point. In other words, this was the focus of his discussion. For Sadducees say that there is no resurrection, this is what Acts 23 8 says, and no angel or spirit, but the Pharisees confess both. So the Sadducees were materialists. They essentially almost, though they believed in God, they believed that life ended at the grave. And the Pharisees believed, obviously, that it did not, that life continued on, and that there was a resurrection of the dead. The Sadducees rejected that. So they end up basically arguing with each other. The Pharisees agreed with Paul about the resurrection, but the Sadducees argued that there was no resurrection. Then there rose a loud outcry, and the scribes of the Pharisees' party arose and protested, saying, We find no evil in this man, but if a spirit or an angel spoke to him, let's not fight against God. So they were saying, Hey, we have no issue with the fact that some angel or spirit might have talked to Paul. Uh, and if that's the case, then we certainly don't want to be fighting with God because the assumption would be that God had sent that angel or spirit to speak with Paul. <clears throat> the contention was enough that the chief captain removed Paul from the mix, fearing he would be torn to pieces between the Pharisees and Sadducees who were now fighting with each other. So these guys go together. Paul's in the middle of it. They have to rescue him again. So Paul was brought back to the barracks for safekeeping from the Jews. However, over 40 Jews bound themselves by an oath not to eat or drink until they killed Paul. They're pretty angry. Uh, this plot became known to Paul's nephew and was communicated to Lysias, who took action to protect Paul. So Paul's nephew come to visit him, said, hey, Uncle Paul, I heard that this was going to happen. They have these Jews that took a vow. And he said, look, you need to go explain this to Lysias. So Lysias took the information, uh, obviously verified it. And then um, 
decided he had to move Paul. So the plot was to request Paul be brought to the Sanhedrin to clarify the charges in more detail, but the Jews were going to lie in wait and ambush Paul by overtaking any Roman escort he would have. It would have been impossible to battle over 40 angry Jews bound on killing Paul with just a few soldiers, because there's no reason that Lysias would have had um, any large contingent of uh, soldiers accompanying Paul. He was just going over to have a discussion with the Jews. So it was all a ruse. Um, it was very deceptive. They just wanted to set Paul up to kill him and probably in the midst of it would have had to kill Roman soldiers too. So Lysias sent Paul by the cover of darkness that night to Caesarea with an escort of 470 Roman soldiers. Caesarea was where the Roman governor resided and a larger Roman army presence for Paul's safekeeping. A letter accompanied Paul to Felix, who was the governor at the time, so that he would understand why Paul was sent to him. <clears throat> so, Acts 23, uh, near the end, it says, he wrote a letter in the following manner. Claudius Lysias, um, to the most excellent governor Felix, greetings. This man was seized by the Jews and was about to be killed by them. Coming with the troops, I rescued him, having learned that he was a Roman. And when I wanted to know the reason they accused him, I brought him before their council. I found out that he was accused concerning questions of their law, but had nothing charged against him deserving of death or chains. In other words, he hadn't broken any Roman laws. And when it was told me that the Jews lay in wait for the man, I sent him immediately to you and also commanded his accusers to state before you the charges against him farewell. So upon his arrival down to Caesarea, Felix decided to keep Paul in Herod's judgment hall until his accusers could come from Caes uh, come to Caesarea. Uh, Paul will not have now. Paul will not leave this location until he is sent to Rome. In chapter twenty-seven, he gives his greatest defense at this location. Now, Luke spends five chapters setting this up. 21 through 25 is set, set, uh, spent setting up Acts 26. After this, Luke tells us about Paul's journey on to Rome in 27 and 28. So the reason we're going through this, if, if Luke is going to spend eight chapters in a 28-chapter book, not that originally Acts had chapters, but the point is, is that if he's going to spend that much time explaining this aspect of the almost the last third of the book of Acts, um, shouldn't we understand how Paul got there and why he was there and what he said when he was there? I think so. So let's look at God's purpose. God was pleased with Paul's testimony before the Jews back in chapter 21. We learned that. Uh, though things seemed to be out of control and Paul was now a political prisoner. But Jesus had appeared to Paul when he was in jail, after speaking to the Jews, which ended up in a riot in Jerusalem, and he said, Be of good cheer, Paul, for as you have testified for me in Jerusalem, you must also bear witness at Rome, uh, Acts twenty-three eleven. Thus, though things seemed to be out of control in human terms, God was using those circumstances to achieve his purpose in preaching the gospel with the Gentile plan uh, to the Jerusalem Jews. So um, this is all God's working, we'll see. And uh, it is interesting that, um, you know, God will move Paul through these different circumstances, which is not a big deal for us for we're not in them, but we're certainly not comfortable for Paul. So this message of Jesus to Paul when he was in jail that night also informs us that Jesus was pleased with Paul's testimony and God would get Paul to Rome to have the gospel faithfully shared there also. I want to put a note in because I think I forgot to put it in at the end. Our responsibility in sharing the gospel is not the results. Paul was not responsible for the results of the gospel. He was only responsible to share it. God and people will end up making the results. So, um, 
people certainly need to be open and believe. Uh, God is trying to get them to that point, but they have the freedom to reject as well as believe. So um, many times we feel condemned or we misunderstand the fact that um, it is not within the realm of our responsibility or capability to make somebody believe. God doesn't even make them believe. Uh, God offers them the truth and tries to convince them and convict them to believe by the Holy Spirit, by the additional evidence, a person witnessing to them, the work that Christ is doing in the church. There's, there's a number of factors, including the power in the gospel itself. Like Paul said in Romans 1, he's not ashamed of the gospel for it. The gospel message is the power of God unto salvation to those who, who will believe. So um, Paul was successful because he successfully communicated. He was not unsuccessful just because the Jews rejected the message. So going on here, it says, but there was more to do before Paul left for Rome. And his greatest apologetic work would be before who's who's who audience that Paul couldn't have dreamed to have the opportunity to speak to. This was God's purpose. So before moving on, it must be remembered that when Paul came to faith in Acts 9, Ananias was told that Paul was a specially selected servant by God and what that service entailed. Ananias being hesitant to approach Paul because of his violent reputation among the church prompted Jesus to confirm to Ananias this was God's doing. Go, for he is a chosen vessel of mine to bear my name before Gentiles, kings, and the children of Israel, for I will show him how many things he must suffer for my namesake. Acts 9, 15, and 16. Paul would have an opportunity to bear Jesus' name before the Gentiles and kings, which occurs in Acts 26. Paul's appearance before Agrippa and the entourage of people that he and Festus had with them was where Paul gave his greatest defense, his apologetic, of the Christian faith. However, God needed to put Paul physically in the place to be safe and give this opportunity. Give his opportunity. Uh, God's guidance is clear throughout these chapters, which we'll look at. So let's look at how God protects him. Upon hearing of the plot to kill Paul, the chief captain called for two centurions, saying, Prepare 200 soldiers, 70 horsemen, 200 spearmen to go to Caesarea at the third hour of the night and provide mounts to set Paul on and bring him safely to Felix the governor. This is the 470 Roman soldier escort that Paul got. Uh, this was traveling in safety to Caesarea with 470 Roman soldiers as an escort. Additionally, it was done in the cover of darkness before the Jews who were hostile to Paul knew what had happened. Since God wanted Paul to go to Rome, God was going to protect Paul in his travels. This didn't mean the journey would be without difficulty, but it did mean that Paul would survive to make it to Rome and would be at the expense of the Roman government. So they were going on Rome's dime. The chief captain, uh, Claudius Lysias, sent a letter with Paul to Felix, which we read, uh, the Roman governor of the Judean province, which explained why he sent Paul to him. Claudius really didn't know what to do with Paul, but knew he needed to keep him safe, prevent a riot, and get to the bottom of the charges against him. He hoped that Felix could work it out with the Jews, since he was limited at his location, and Paul's safety was couldn't really be uh, assured. Upon arrival, Felix informed Paul that he would deal with the situation when Paul's accusers came to Caesarea to explain their case against him. There's an interesting note in the Believer's Bible commentary. It's about Felix, and it says, Felix had enjoyed a, a meteoric rise from slavery to a position of political prominence in the Roman Empire. As to his personal life, he was, a gross, he was grossly immoral, at the time of his appointment to the governor, to be governor of the province of Judea, he was husband of three royal ladies. While in office, he fell in love with Drusilla, who was married to um, Azusas, king of uh, Emesra. According to Josephus, a marriage was arranged through Simon, sorcerer from Cyprus. 
He was a cruel despot, uh, as is evidenced by the fact that he arranged the assassination of a high priest named Jonathan, who criticized him for his misrule. It was this Felix before, before whom Paul had to appear. This gives you a little idea of this guy Felix and um, where he's coming from. So let's look at some of the wisdom that Paul exercised. So five days after Paul arrived at Caesarea, Ananias, the high priest, arrived with the Sanhedrin and a Roman named Tertullus hired to be their prosecuting attorney. This is in chapter 24. He stood before Felix and brought the charges against Paul. The hatred of the Jews had for Paul and Christ is seen in the motivation expressed in this case. Ananias was an old man who was willing to travel 70 miles to Caesarea with the Sanhedrin to hire a Roman lawyer to condemn Paul. I mean, that wasn't an easy journey in those days. The charges of Tertullus, uh, the charges Tertullus accused Paul are, number one, he was a plague or pestilence, a troublemaker corrupting others. Number two, everywhere uh, he created insurrection or uprising among the Jews. Number three, he was a ringleader, cult leader of a sect or a heresy of the Nazarenes. And number four, he tried to profane the temple, which the Jews tried to judge uh, according to their law back in chapter 23, agreeing with Lysias' report. Uh, Tertullus didn't mention that the Jews tried to kill him back in Acts 21. However, the implication from the accusations are that Felix should kill Paul. In other words, we couldn't put him to death, but you should. So Paul gave his own defense at this trial. Uh, he was familiar with Roman law and knew that those who accused him must be present to prove their case. Hearsay was not proof. Thus, Paul denied the charges and demanded proof of the charges, which the Jews did not have. They had claims. They did not have a case. Paul then ex explained to Felix that he wasn't involved in a sect or a heresy. In other words, this is in relation to Judaism but followed the logical conclusion of Judaism that was the way, that's what it was called, he was following. The hope of the resurrection was something that all Israel looked for and was not heresy. So, I mean, this is, Paul is basically validating from the scriptures. This is what we all hope for as Jews. What, why am I being accused of a heresy? This is all written in the prophets of Israel, so he wasn't creating a different sect or following beliefs that were at variance to Israel's national hope. Paul then explained the reason he was in Jerusalem was to bring arms to Israel, and it was Jews from Asia that created the problem when they saw him. They attacked him in the temple. He wasn't doing anything. Paul further explained he did not have time to accomplish what he was being accused of. Albert Barnes has a reference to Beza's explanation of the days, and he says this. The first, meaning the first day, because <clears throat> um, Paul said, you know, there's only 12 days that he was dealing with. The first uh, was that, that on which he came to Jerusalem, Acts 21.15. The second, he spent with James and the apostles, 21.18. Six days were spent in fulfilling his vow, uh, Acts 21. Uh, 21 and 26. On the ninth day, the tumult arose, being the seventh day of his vow. On this day, he was rescued by Lysias. Gives you the verses. The tenth day, he was before the Sanhedrin. On the eleventh day, the plot was laid to take his life. And on the same day at evening, he was removed to Caesarea. Is now the twelfth day. So, um, the bottom line of Paul's defense is provided when he said to Felix concerning the resurrection of the dead, I'm being judged by you this day. In other words, I didn't have time to incite a rebellion. This, you know, basically, um, all my days were taken care of. Felix then uh, deferred Paul until Lysias, the chief captain, could come and provide more detail until then. Paul was to have freedom and visitors as he chose, so he was just there waiting. Paul was called before Felix and his wife Drusilla again. It was at this time that Paul explained faith in Christ. Um, 
to him and his wife and whoever else was there. The next verse is very telling. Now, as he reasoned about righteousness, talking about Paul, self-control and judgment to come, Felix was afraid and answered, go your way now. When I have a convenient time, I'll call for you. But Felix never responded to Paul's appeal of the gospel, but kept him in prison for two years, seeing him off and hoping Paul would pay a bribe to be set free. So that's that's where we're coming from with Felix, um, which gives you some measure of his corruption because, um, you know, he was willing to somehow let Paul go as long as he would pay him off. This guy's like a mafia leader, which is why Rome ended up recalling him um, <clears throat> after these years that Paul was in prison. Felix was called back to Rome because of his cruelty and corruption. Tacitus said of him, uh, though all cruelty and licentiousness, uh, through all cruelty and licentiousness, he exercised the authority of a king with the spirit of a slave. He was a despot. Looking for a bribe from Paul was indication of, of this corruption. Felix put Paul back in chains when he returned to Rome to make the Jews happy until uh, Porteus Festus came to replace Felix at his station of governing Judea for Rome. So Felix was gone. Festus is now coming in. So let's look at the opportunity. Paul had two years that he patiently waited for justice. He needed to trust the Lord during this time. Jesus had appeared to him and told him to give the same message in Rome. Thus, Paul knew he was going there. But when? It was a matter of time. He didn't know how or when. He just knew that he would get there. You know, it's interesting. Uh, G. Campbell Morgan, in his commentary, makes a point of the fact that um, he believes that God gave Paul rest in these two years. Paul had been running hard. He'd been going uh, on... Uh, you know, his missionary journeys and, you know, he had got beat up. He had been thrown in prison um, with Silas uh, in Philippi. Uh, they threw him out of um, um, Iconia and, and Derby when he was uh, on uh, earlier missionary journey. They threw him outside the, the city and um, thought he was dead, which he probably was. Then God brought him back. He got up, brushed himself off, said, let's keep going. So uh, Paul was probably physically feeling um, the results of, of his just fervent drive and service for Christ. Um, he talks to the Corinthians about how, though the outer man is perishing, the inner man is renewed day by day. Um, you know, he talked to the Corinthians about how, um, you know, he was suffering, talking about him and his missionary team, you know, um, they were suffering so the Corinthians didn't have to. And it's just, it's really interesting. You get these indications as he went through um, writing the epistles, trying to communicate the fact. I mean, in Second Corinthians 1, he said, look, we talking about his ministry team. We get to the point where we despaired of life. Things were not easy for Paul. So G. Campbell Morgan makes the point that he thinks that God gave him a couple of years of rest um, where not only he could probably heal up and get his strength and everything, but people could come and go and minister to him. He could do his study and his teaching and whatever he was doing without, uh, you know, some threat of violence against him. God would now give Paul opportunity to share before Festus, Agrippa, and many other dignities, dignitaries, which is an audience that Paul could not could never have had unless this situation was created it was a divine setup but this didn't make it any more comfortable for paul i mean obviously he was still um, in the situation that he was in festus arrived and met the jewish leaders uh, which asked if paul could be moved to jerusalem to be judged this is now acts 25 but festus said he would be kept at Caesarea. This was more uh, divine intervention, uh, for there was no evident reason for the decision, and the Jews only requested the move because they plotted to kill Paul when Festus moved him. In other words, <laughs> they still had that on their minds. So this chapter 25 provides, provides a setup for Paul's apologetic in chapter 26. 
The turning point was when Paul was brought before Festus and the Jews again came down from Jerusalem to lay their charges against Paul that they still could not prove. It says, while he answered for himself, neither against the law of the Jews nor against the temple nor against Caesar have I offended in anything at all. But Festus, wanting to do the Jews a favor, answered Paul and said, Are you willing to go to Jerusalem and there be judged before me concerning these things? So Paul said, I stand at Caesar's judgment seat where I ought to be judged. For the Jews I have done no wrong, as you very well know. For I am, uh, if I am an offender or have committed anything deserving of death, I do not object to dying. But if there is nothing in these things, talking about the accusations of which these men accuse me, um, no one can deliver me to them. I appeal to Caesar. Then Festus, when he had conferred with the council, answered, he said, you have appealed to Caesar, to Caesar you shall go. And that's Acts 25, 8 to 12. Now Paul, now that Paul appealed, yeah, easy for me to say, now that Paul appealed to Caesar, which is a Roman citizen, he could do if he felt the need for justice. Festus must send him to be judged at Caesar's seat. Festus may not have been pleased with Paul's demand to be sent to Caesar because Festus knew it would not please the Jews, who he was trying to get along with, uh, being the new governor. But he conferred with his advisors on the provincial council. They made it clear that Paul was within his rights. Festus had no choice. He needed to send Paul to Caesar. After this, King Agrippa and Bernice, his sister, came to meet the new governor. Festus explained uh, the situation to Agrippa. G. Campbell Morgan says of Agrippa, Agrippa II was the last of the Herods. His great-grandfather had murdered the innocents at the birth of Jesus. His granduncle had murdered John the Baptist at the caprice of a, of a wanton. In other words, he just wanted to make the crowd happy. His father, Agrippa I, had executed James. I'm sorry, that's actually what Agrippa I did. And seeing that it pleased the people, had sought to lay hands on Peter also. Each of these men had died or had been disgraced soon after the events referred to. So, um, and again... Grippa died within the last, you know, two to three years after hearing Paul's witness. The Complete Biblical Library says of Bernice, Bernice, which means victorious, was married first to her uncle, Herod of uh, Chalcis. After his death, she married uh, Pullman, king of Cilicia, but deserted him and came to live with her brother, Herod Agrippa II. She lived a very immoral life. Later, she became the mistress of Emperor Vespian and then of Emperor Titus. So she got around. So, But this gives us some background and understanding of who these people are and the people that Paul is talking to. This is the audience Paul was given with more to be added. Festus realized that the charges related to Paul were about Jewish superstition that the man Jesus, which had died, Paul declared to be alive. Knowing that Agrippa was familiar with the Jewish beliefs and scriptures, he felt Agrippa might be able to make more sense of the charges so Festus would not look so foolish, sending a man who technically was not condemned to Caesar Augustus for judgment. Agrippa wanted to hear Paul the following day, and Festus was happy to accommodate the meeting. Festus was hoping to get what he wanted in clarifying charges and Agrippa uh, what he wanted in understanding better the controversy surrounding Jesus of Nazareth, which had caused such stir among the Jews in Judah and Jerusalem. I mean, this was going to advantage these leaders in different ways. So... <clears throat> The following day, the audience was set and prepared by God for Paul. This was to be the setup for his great apologetic of the Christian faith before those in power. As a reminder, at Paul's conversion, Jesus told Ananias that Paul is a chosen vessel of mine to bear my name before Gentiles, kings, and children of Israel. Acts 9.15 Paul had done 
his service before the Gentiles and children of Israel. But now Paul was before King Agrippa and Festus, uh, the two most powerful men that oversaw Judea uh, and would have an influence on the Jews that lived there. Additionally, we find there were others there to hear Paul. It says, So the next day when Agrippa and Bernice had come with great pomp, and had entered the auditorium with the commanders and the prominent men of the city. At Festus's command, Paul was brought in, Acts 25, 23. God put together the who's who of leaders in the Judean area for Paul to provide his greatest defense of the Christian faith. Luke, recognizing the magnitude of this event, devotes five chapters just to set up the apologetic given in Acts 26. So now let's take a look at Paul's apologetic. So <clears throat> before we jump into talking about um, Paul's apologetic, um, earlier I said that um, Paul was, he had appealed to Caesar and um, uh, Festus referred to him as Augustus. Well, th that, that wasn't his name, that was a title uh, that was actually given, and um, that is really, uh, it was Caesar Nero that was the Caesar at the time. Uh, Augustus was uh, the title given them because uh, they started to take that on, um, thinking that they were like gods. But anyways, um, Nero was the actual Caesar at the time. So after Paul explained his upbringing, and so we're now in um, Acts 26, where Paul's making his defense. And after he explained his upbringing and education as a Pharisee to Agrippa, he started his defense by saying, And now I stand and am judged for the hope of the promise made by God to our fathers. To this promise are twelve tribes earnestly serving God night and day hope to obtain. For this hope's sake, King Agrippa, I am accused by the Jews. Why should it be thought incredible by you that God raises the dead? So this is where Paul starts. And this is important because, again, he's keeping the resurrection as the forefront and focus of his testimony here. Now, <clears throat> regarding the resurrection... If God exists, then miracles are possible. The universe is the greatest miracle. The resurrection is not the greatest miracle, not, not from God's perspective. Now, the resurrection would be easy, right? If God can create life from nothing, if he can create the universe from nothing, which he did just by speaking, then he can certainly bring whatever life he creates, especially physical life, back to life. And that's really what we're dealing with with the resurrection. So this is not difficult um, from that perspective. This is why Paul says, and again, um, the you in the verse, why should it be thought incredible by you that God raises the dead? This is addressed to all of them. Though he's speaking to King Agrippa, Paul is addressing this, this concept um, you know, this teaching of the resurrection to everybody. And, um, and it's important for us to understand because if there is no resurrection, there is no Christianity. Christianity made the New Testament. It made the people that wrote it. Um, and Christianity is made by the resurrection. The resurrection is the end all of everything. Now, <clears throat> skeptics, uh, atheists, people that are unbelievers that don't like Christianity, don't like the concept of God or whatever, they understand this and they they attack it. So, um, look, I, I got books on my shelves over here, you know, uh, Morrison, uh, Frank Morrison, Who Moved the Stone? Um, you know, th there are uh, numerous skeptics, I mean, evidence that demands a verdict from years ago, Josh McDowell. Uh, there's there's many, many skeptics, um, Simon Greeleaf back at Harvard, um, who looked into the resurrection, tried to disprove it, and through that um, ended up becoming Christians. I mean, um, 
you know, th there are so many books written by former atheists and skeptics because when they look at the evidence, the evidence stands up. Um, it's really no different today uh, than it was 2,000 years ago. And we have the same evidence corroborated by history and archaeology. So Paul then explains his past antagonism to Christianity, just like these atheists that we're talking about. Paul was not an atheist, but he felt as though, um, you know, this was the Christianity was a perversion and a cult um, <clears throat> until he gets saved and realized that Jesus of Nazareth actually was the Messiah who raised from the dead. So Paul explains his past antagonism to Christianity prior to his coming to the faith. Now, we're at 50 minutes here. Uh, we got a ways to go, so we're going to have to make this um, part one, and we should be able to do a part two and finish it up later. But anyways, uh, we'll do that at this point uh, since we're at 50 minutes. So look, read ahead, read through these chapters uh, from 21 all the way through 26. Read through them a number of times because you, you, you'll be surprised at what you pick up the second, the third, the fourth time. You know, uh, I quoted G. Campbell Morgan a couple of times. G. Campbell Morgan used to say that he would read a passage of Scripture 50 times before he put pen to paper. Before he wrote on it, he wanted to make sure he had it so uh, much a part of his thinking and his perspective and everything that he would just keep reading it over again. Because as you notice, like I, even myself, when I go through the Bible, uh, for myself or to teach it, um, I end up, you know, you read through over and over and you realize after you read, you know, you may have read it five times, but then you read over it again uh, or maybe on the 10th time going through it. And it's like something hit you that didn't hit you before. It's like, you know, you study a book of the Bible, um, you grasp all these things from it. You say, wow, that was really great. Well, later on, when you go through it and study it again, you can pick up all new themes and everything else. So um, we'll never exhaust what's there, but we want to get as much out of it as we can. So look, until next time, um, try to go through those chapters, see what you can pick up on your own. Um, and until then, may God richly bless you as you continue to study his word.